Welcome to another episode of Preparing for the Unexpected. I'm your host, Alex Fullick, and as always, we like to talk about things related to well-being, resilience, business continuity, emergency management, uh, crisis management, anything that can help you, your organization, or your community prepare for, respond to, and overcome adverse situations. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, please feel free. You can find me at LinkedIn. I'm the only Alex Fullick there, so I'm really easy to find and I do respond to everything I get. Alternatively, you can find me at alexfullick.com and we'll see about getting you on the show. Longtime viewers and listeners, you know I love to read. I've always got a couple of books on the go at any given moment. Uh, my bookshelves are overflowing, piled up on the floor. I've probably got a fire hazard in my house. You know, so many books and magazines that I love to read. And today I'm lucky enough to have uh, a book that uh, caught my attention, and I think uh, we've seen it in the headlines a lot lately, this topic. I'd like to welcome to the show the author of Burnout Proof, Michael Levitt. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alex. Looking forward to our conversation today. Yes, and congratulations on the book, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, now, I know we've exchanged... Um, emails back and forth, and I, I've read your book and, and things like that. But could you take a minute or two and tell us about yourself, what you do, and how you got into what you do? Oh, definitely. Thank you so much. So again, my name is Michael Levitt. I'm the founder and chief burnout officer. That title came to me in the shower, by the way, uh, mm -hmm. of Breakfast Leadership Network. And it's a consulting firm uh, based out of Toronto and San Diego, and I work with organizations on burnout prevention. I had my own burnout story, which we'll share later on. But as we know, and as you mentioned, burnout is something that is more prevalent than ever. And this pandemic that we've been in has unfortunately made it worse for a lot of people. And the work that I do is to help organizations you know, create environments that can be burnout proof for their organizations so they can keep their employees happy and healthy and producing, uh, which as consumers, you and I benefit from. And as you said, it's a, you know, it's a topic that's impacting everybody. And by that, I want to clarify, we're even seeing in the headlines that CEOs and company presidents and, you know, all the people you think that many people think have it easy are burning out, not just, you know, ourselves, you know, the grunts, the worker ants, so to speak, but it's everybody now. It, it isn't just one group or particular group that's uh, experiencing this, right? It's every sector, it's every position from the CEO all the way down to the janitor and everywhere in between. You know, let's pick on the janitor for a second. Okay, now all of a sudden, not saying the janitor wasn't keeping things clean. Now they have to really keep it clean and disinfected and wipe down and plexiglass and floor stickers and everything that we've uh, grown accustomed to seeing in our workplaces and wherever we happen to go. And the CEOs have had a really challenging time as well as everybody, but the CEOs in particular, because they've had to navigate through these very choppy times and there was no playbook. There wasn't a mentor or a leadership guide to say how to navigate a pandemic. Let's toss in, you know, people that want to quit because of the great resignation. Okay, let's throw in supply chain challenges. Let's throw in restaurants are open or are they closed? Are they open? Or are they closed? All the things that we've been experiencing these last two years, it's you literally, you, you wake up and you go, okay, what is today going to throw me? And I think by now, you know, many of us are, are battle-worn, um, maybe fatigued, definitely. In many cases, a lot of us are fatigued. But the CEOs have really had a difficult time because they've had to navigate not only all those challenges I mentioned, but everyone was sent home, if we all recall, in March of 2020. So organizations that may have never allowed their employees to work remotely, all of a sudden, everyone was for a period of time, and many are still working remotely. And getting the systems in place, how do we work with each other? How do we deliver products and services to our customers? What do our customers need right now? Because that was another thing that changed as well was the things that many of us delivered as organizations needed to shift because those things that we needed prior to March of 2020 may not be what we need right now. So the successful organizations that have been able to navigate through this figured out, okay, what do our customers need right now? Okay. Can we get that stuff? Can we, is our team able to deliver that? So again, there's just uncertainty, which 
is one of the biggest things that, you know, impact everyone's lives, but especially executives and leaders, because if they don't know what's going to happen, it's very hard to plan and direct. So it's been a very tough time for our executives, again, across every sector. Yeah. And at the same time, they're working at home as well. And for many, um, uh, they will have families that are schooling at home. So suddenly they went from a CEO to, well, they're already a parent, but now a teacher. You know, they have to entertain little kids every so often. It, it really compiled, you know, uh, the, the, the issue, which, which leads me to my first question then. What is burnout? Burnout is prolonged stress. That's a simple definition. Without prolonged stress, you can't burn out. It's not zero to burn out. You have prolonged stress because you're overwhelmed, you're fatigued, you're mentally and physically drained, and you cannot keep up with the overwhelming demands of life. It tends to be work-driven, but as we've seen with this pandemic, and it's a great example that you shared, many of us you know, working in offices and all of that were sent home. And our kids were also sent home. So we were also, as you said, school teachers now too. Mm -hmm. And if you noticed the time we work, many of us anyway, I know there's a lot of people that work evening shifts and overnight shifts, but many of us work that, you know, kind of nine to five block, give or take. Guess what? Kids school time tends to be in that same time block. So you're trying to do your work and educate your kids at the same time. Um, How'd that work out for you? It didn't. So a lot of people would either a get up earlier to get ahead of the work a little bit, do the schoolwork and then work into the evening. Well, guess what? Prolonged hours. And when you're working long hours, that takes a toll on you. Uh, Your productivity decreases over a long period of time. You're stretched thin. So many other things uh, came into play, you know, the lack of activity and uh, we'll go over this later, but that's been a big problem with this pandemic too, is a lot of people weren't as active than they were before the pandemic. Even if they didn't go to the gym or work out or exercise or things like that, you still get an activity when you get up, you drive to work, you're walking around your offices, you're going from meeting to meeting, whatever, you go to get lunch, go to get coffee, all that stuff. You're moving around a lot more than you think. Well, mm-hmm. when you're home and things are closed because you know, there are restrictions or mandates or whatnot, then all of a sudden you're walking is limited to your home. Now, if you've got a big house, great. But most people have a moderately sized apartment or home and they're not getting in the steps that they used to. So your body's not getting the activity. So that stress doesn't have a way to get released. So it just starts compiling and building up over time. And that's when you start running into situations of burnout. Well, I know know if it wasn't for my dog, I wouldn't have been out and about in the neighborhood you know, quite a few times. So uh, luckily he's, you know, been a godsend, so to speak, you know, to get me out and walking around um, uh, to uh, actually it makes up for the times that I wouldn't have been walking or or would have been walking around in an office or even to the train, you know, to, to the office and to the car and back and forth and those kind of things. So lucky I've got the dog. Absolutely. So um, how do you recognize signs of burnout and what are not just recognizing, but what are the signs? The common signs I see with people and with teams as well are one, how are you sleeping? How's your sleep? Is it good? Are you getting good night's sleep night after night? Or has your sleep been bad? And if it's been bad, you're not sleeping throughout the night. And that's been going on for a long period of time. That's problematic because your body does a lot of repair jobs while you sleep. Your gut bacteria is working and all that other good stuff. So if you're not sleeping well, and you're not getting that good deep sleep, then your body is using its energy to, you know, deal with that and not addressing the built up stress that you had from today. So if it's Mm -hmm. prolonged, then today's stress gets piled into tomorrow's stress, then the next day and the next day, then you start dealing with some physical and mental challenges because, Sleep is very important. It impacts our cognitive ability. It impacts our ability to reason. It it impacts our relationships, our communication style, um, our, like I said, pattern awareness. So we can recognize things. So if you're a leader, for example, one of the tasks you do is problem solving. You know, people come to you all the time with 
here's the burning issue of the moment and you have to problem solve, figure out, okay, what do we need to do to address this? If you're cloudy and you're not feeling well and you haven't rested well, your ability to process the information is impacted. So sleep is a real big warning sign. If you're not getting good sleep or somebody you know or work with isn't Mm -hmm. getting good sleep, that's a big warning sign. Coupled with that is, are you starting to make more mistakes or are you forgetful? You're making mistakes at work that you normally wouldn't do, or are you forgetting things that, again, you wouldn't normally forget? That's another sign that your head is you know, not clear on, on certain things. Relationships is a good thing, too, because if you are more short-tempered or maybe argumentative with your spouse or your boss, it's never a good thing for either of those, but it's not good for job security for your boss. It's not good for home security if you're arguing with your spouse. But when you are stressed and you're burning out, you're, you're so tense that anything can set you off. And that's a big warning sign if that's not your normal demeanor. If you are more short with your kids or your spouse or, again, your, your coworkers or your boss, that's definitely a big warning sign. And one of the big signs too is a lack of motivation. And I'm not talking about Monday morning, lack of motivation. We all have that, (laughs) but it's the lack of motivation to do things. And I'm not just talking about work. I'm talking about things that you normally like doing, whether it's going for a drive or having coffee with your friend or going to a sporting event or coffee shop. Um, Let's say you get season tickets to the Blue Jays and all of a sudden you stop going. You're like, why are you stop going? You already paid for the tickets. You got the parking, you got all that stuff squared away. You're just not motivated. You don't feel like going because you've been working too long and you're too tired to go and things like that. That's a big sign. If you stop doing things in life that are actually good for you and you enjoy doing, that's a big, big warning sign that you're probably burning out. What about staying on the topic of the pandemic? A lot of those things, you know, going to a concert or going for coffee or watching the Blue Jays or the Leafs, whoever, mm-hmm. um, we were told we can't do those things. Mm-hmm. So was the, if those kind of um, ac- actions you know, or mandates or restrictions or safety protocols, you know, different people use different terms, as those were put in place, was that contributing or do you think it was contributing to some people's burnout because they couldn't do the things they wanted to, even though they wanted to? Yeah, it definitely could uh, because they weren't able to do that. So they didn't have that. I don't want to call it an escape, but a release or a refresher to do things. Mm-hmm. And I've told people that are you know going through these types of situations, which we've been dealing with for a couple of years now, um, and even currently uh, in some instances is Look for things you like to do that you can still do. You'd man, you'd mention, you know, walking your dog. Okay, that's good. So, weather permitting, maybe walk a little bit longer if your dog is up for it. And because I know some dogs, you know, have a limit to where they walk, and some other dogs, you could walk them twenty four seven, and it's still not enough to tire them out. I know I've seen those dogs around. Uh, my dog, thankfully, is low energy, so it's like okay, we take them on long walks, but not, you know. You know, we're not going to walk from from Toronto to London type of situation. But at the end of the day, look for things that you still can do. You know, it could be watching Netflix or in your example you gave earlier, reading books. Okay, guess what? You can still read books in a pandemic. You can still go get coffee. Now you can't sit inside the coffee shop. But, you know, I saw this a lot. and I'm sure you did, too. In parking lots by the coffee shop or nearby, you might see some people that are in their vehicles they're physically distanced, but they're, you know, chatting with, you know, a colleague or a friend and, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're far enough away where they could still talk. And, and, you know, I did that too, you know, meeting up with people, you know, to be safe and all of that in the early days of the pandemic, um, you know, phone calls, you know, zoom calls, you know, to connect. I know a lot of people, yes, zoom calls for work related things and all that, but I know a lot of people that, you know, they'd all jump on a zoom call with a bunch of their friends and, grab an adult beverage and, you know, maybe they'll have the game on TV or maybe they're just going to talk and see how things are going and talk about what, you know, what they've learned. So there's still things you can do even in a lockdown or in a pandemic. It's just figuring out what those things are and making sure you allocate time to do them. Yeah, well, I'll share with you one of mine because it, it popped into my head as you were, you were 
talking there. Uh, one of the things that I, I've done uh, in the last two years, being at home and because of Zoom calls and things like that, I was used to being in the car, driving for an hour and then taking an hour train ride. Well, that hour in the car to the train station and the hour home, I always had a couple of CDs or a CD blaring in the car and just screaming along along with it, you know, having a great old time, you know, just, I don't care. It releases any tension that built up during the day. So now I, now that I'm at home, I'm listening, doing the same thing here. I'm listening to, to music while I'm working, you know, no Zoom call, no one can see me or hear me, thank goodness. So, <laughs> but singing along that way. And it's like, you know, this is making it easier, you know, because that's what I used to do. And I couldn't do it for a long time. And it was frustrating me. And I realized what it was. And now I'm actually, you know, back to that. I'm just not in my car, but I'm singing along and I feel better. I love that you've done that. And one of the couple of things that I've done too is older hobbies or, you know, listening to music. I do the same thing. You know, I'll listen to some music that I haven't listened to in a long time. You know, I might, you know, say, you know, tell, you know, whatever music subscription I have, ask it to play a particular genre of music. And I mix it up. You know, I, I listen to all kinds of different music. So, and I like listening to some stuff that I haven't listened to in a long time. And also, I like listening to new releases from new artists that I've never heard. And, you know, during this pandemic, there's been a handful of music artists that I did not know existed at all. And they, they're not new. They've been around for, you know, 15 or 20 years kind of thing. And it just, for some reason, flew under my radar because I tend to be very set in my ways as far as particular playlists and all that. It's like, let's expand the horizon a little bit and listen to different things. You might find a new artist or a new to you type of thing and you know, just you know, feel better and all that. So I love that you did that and you, that you carried that through and you, you, you made it apply to how you're doing now. Um, and the nice thing too, is as this pandemic ends and allegedly it will rumor has it, uh, we'll see. Uh, but as it ends, there's some new habits that we've picked up, hopefully good ones, maybe some that aren't so good. But harmonize those things that you've learned and things that you actually enjoy doing into your ritual. Don't close the book on them. Because if you've enjoyed doing them now, I think you'll enjoy doing them in whatever the next normal looks like. And that's going to vary for a lot of people you know, with work and is it going to be remote, home, hybrid, all these things that have kind of changed around a bit. Um, going back to the way things were, for many of us is not going to be possible. It's going to, it's going to be different and coming to grips with that and working through it. So it can be the best for you is some exercise that you should probably start thinking about now, if you haven't you know, changed back into going into the office, if you had an office a few days a week, start getting mm -hmm. those things back into your habit. And this is one pro tip that I've been sharing a lot at the conferences that I speak at, you know, a lot of them, of course, being via Zoom and all of that is if you think you're going to be called back into the office in the near future and you've been wearing T-shirts and sweatpants as your work attire for the last two years, please go into your closet and try on your work clothes because there's a distinct possibility that they will not fit. So I don't, I'm not saying anything, but my hunch is they may not because of lack of activity. Maybe you've had stress and you, you know, people lose weight at stress. Some people gain, you never know. So it could be too big, could be too small, but try those things on. And assuming they don't fit, you've got a window of opportunity. Number one, you can figure out, okay, I need to lose the weight so I can fit into them or two, go buy some new clothes that actually fit. And, you know, proceed accordingly, because even though workplaces have new you know, rules and guidelines on remote work and all of that kind of good stuff, my hunch is they're not going to change the dress code to T-shirt and sweatpants. I I'm just saying they might. They might. There's, I've worked at organizations before that I saw people show up, you know, software company. They were, you know, down the developers, you know. I think the only policy they had was please wear clothes. I think that was the only thing that was required for them. So I saw all kinds of different things. It didn't bother me. I'm like, oh, yeah, it doesn't bug me. But in many cases, your, your workplace may not be okay with that. So 
maybe trying those clothes that you haven't worn since uh, late 2019 or early 2020 and, and see if they fit. If they don't, well, then you've got time, hopefully, to yeah. either get some new or you know, lose some weight or gain some weight, whatever the case may be to make sure your clothes fit. So that's just a, a side pro tip. Yeah. <laughs> and a good one too. I, I, I think I'd be afraid to uh, probably try on some of mine <laughs> after all this time. Like, uh, I don't think any of those are going to fit. <laughs> I was, I spoke at a conference last month in person, physical in front of real human beings. And it was really weird trying to find the zoom button in that conference room. I'm like, where's this record button? Where's the, I don't, I didn't see any of the settings, but I wore a suit. And again, I hadn't put out this suit since 2019. I'm like, Ooh, this is going to be interesting. So I put it on and went, okay, I just had to suck it up a little bit. It wasn't too bad, but I'm like, okay, all right. I've somehow been able to maintain not bad. It's like, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that I don't go crazy at the, you know, whatever restaurant was nearby or things like that. So that, that they would still fit the day of speaking. So, but yeah, uh, I know some people, you know, just because of lack of activity, you know, and in convenience of, instead of the snack machine at work, you've got your whole kitchen. So it's, I get it. It's been, you know, and challenging for people and stress eating is something that, you know, a lot of people, you know, do. And again, without the lack of uh, ability to go to a gym or work out or exercise that many of us have been dealing with it. Don't blame yourself. Don't be mad at yourself. That's uh, I got to throw that in. Please do not be upset with yourself. You, you haven't had the opportunity to do the things that you were able to before. So your body is going to adjust accordingly and, and you can, you can make changes to get it back, whether it's, you know, changing your wardrobe or, you know, doing some things to help, you know, drop whatever extra weight you want to carry or want to lose. Yeah. And I think uh, one of the things you mentioned a few minutes ago about the, some of these new habits or new things that we've picked up, um, keep doing them, even if we are quote unquote back to normal, then because that's going to help you down the road when, and if something else happens, right? Well, yeah. And it's, these are, they're new habits. And if you think about it, you know, let's take the pandemic and put it aside for a second. Many of us, especially when we get to adulthood, our patterns, habits, beliefs, thought patterns are pretty much set. Many of us don't really vary much with things. Okay. We might pick up a new hobby or if a friend of ours is saying, Hey, let's, let's do this. Okay. That's fine. But for the most part, we tend to be very routine in our activities in life. So mm-hmm. this pandemic has created the opportunity for many of us to pick up new hobbies or learn new things or do things. Don't, don't just shelve those, do something with them. And if, if they think, or if you feel that the things that you're doing are good for you and beneficial to you, which is what self-care is, is doing things and activities that are beneficial to you. Uh, if those things that you've started doing feels good to you and you enjoy doing them, then please don't stop doing them once the pandemic ends or you go back to work or whatever the situation is, Mm -hmm. make sure that you sprinkle those things in. Now you may not be able to do it the same amount of time that you did before, but you know, even if you do it, you know, a quarter of the time of what you did during the pandemic, you're still going to get some benefit out of it, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. And on that note, we've come to the end of our first segment. We are talking with Michael Levitt, the author of Burnout Proof, and we will be right back. Oh, actually, I want to say for anyone who might want to uh, turn off, Michael's going to talk about his personal experience with burnout in our next segment. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Today, we are talking with Michael Levitt, the author of Burnout Proof. Now, Michael, just as I went away in the last segment, I said you were going to share your personal story. Um, And I think that's one of the reasons why you wrote this book. So can you tell us about your experiences and your personal experience with burnout? Absolutely. It started in 2007. I was hired as a healthcare executive just outside of Windsor, Ontario. And I had in my career, a lot of startup experience, but zero healthcare experience. And here I am leading a medical clinic and navigating through physician recruitment, hiring staff, trying to figure out what an autoclave was and other medical devices that I'd never seen of or heard of before. 
uh, navigating construction of a clinic site and working with the Ontario Ministry of Health on funding challenges and everything else in a very proactive board of directors. As many of us know, if you've been in a startup or launch your own business, there are long hours. And for two years, from 2007 to 2009, I was pretty much working from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. seven days a week uh, for a solid two years. And we all know that's not sustainable. Uh, during that time, wasn't getting a lot of rest. I stopped going to do things that I enjoyed doing. I was a season ticket holder for the Detroit Tigers at the time. It's Windsor, if you're not familiar, is across the border from Detroit, Michigan, where I'm originally from. And I had a season tickets. And the nice thing about season tickets is everything's paid for. The parking, the food vouchers, the beer vouchers, the tickets, everything. So all you have to do is show up. And I quit going because I was too tired and I was fatigued and worn out from working all those hours. And it all came to a crashing halt in May of 2009. Uh, I was mowing my lawn in the front of my house and we had a small lawn. So I had an electric lawnmower because gas prices were expensive then like they are now, ironically. And so I had this electric mower, but it was really bulky to move. And I was mowing and I mowed one row and then I turned the lawnmower to mow another row. I felt this really sharp pain in my chest. I thought that I'd pulled a muscle and I had this discomfort for a few days. And then finally Friday of that week, that pain was more persistent. So I talked to my physician who was also obviously a colleague in the clinic and said, Hey, you know, this is what's been going on this week. So he listens and he goes, that's eh, probably nothing, but let's hook you up to the EKG equipment. And we'll run a test. It was probably, and I'll tell you, share this really quick. It was really embarrassing for me because here I am in the procedure room, you know, about to get an EKG with my coworkers and colleagues. And of course, that means I had to strip down to my underwear. So here I am, the boss, taking his clothes off at work. Not typically allowed in most workplace settings, ladies and gentlemen. So here I am. And of course, back then, you know, they were uh, making all kinds of harassment jokes and things like that, which is definitely a no-no now. But and it was a no-no then too, but they still did it. Uh, but they hooked up, they ran the test. The test came back really problematic cardiologist at Hotel Du Grace Hospital in Windsor saw the results and basically said, tell, tell Michael to get his butt in the hospital right now. And I had had a pretty significant heart attack. I had two blockages in my left interior descending artery, which has a nickname in cardiology world. It's called the widow maker because typically when people have blockages in that artery and they have a heart attack, they don't survive. So I am basically a walking miracle. Um, especially when my cardiologist told me before he put the stents in that artery that I should be dead. Um, I accused him of skipping bedside manner class in medical school and we all laughed about it and he did the procedure and all that, but that set off what I call my year of worst case scenarios. So I had a heart attack and then 17 weeks later, after recovering from my job, the organization wanted to go in a different direction. So they let me go. So I was laid off. So heart attack and then without a job remind you at the timing of this, this was in 2009. So it was the tail end of the great recession and Windsor was a, not a good place to be as far as job opportunities were concerned. So it took me several months to find a new job, which required a relocation to Toronto. And once I got up to Toronto, several months later, um, got a phone call from my oldest daughter and she was crying. And finally I was able to get from her that the bank had come and repossessed her family vehicle. So here we are, heart attack that should have killed me, job loss during the Great Recession, family car repossessed. A few weeks later, we finally found a place to move the family up in Toronto. I was commuting back and forth on the weekends. We move up to the new place. I go back the following weekend to grab a couple things that we left behind in the house. And I opened up the screen door of the house and I saw a sticker on the door and the largest lock I've ever seen in my life that you can't buy at Rona or Home Depot or Lowe's or anything like that. And the sticker said foreclosure. So heart attack that should have killed me, job loss during the great recession, car repossession, home foreclosure. And all those things happened because I was burned out. My burnout put me in those situations where I was making mistakes at work that they felt was necessary to no longer have me as an employee. 
I was not taking care of myself. I quit doing things in life I enjoyed doing. I wasn't eating well, no exercise to speak of. And it all came to a crashing halt all in that year. Now, not being able to make your car payment and the house payment was due to one, not having any insurance and on heart medication that cost me $1,000 a month. So when you got a family, you have to choose. Okay, heart medication to keep me alive, food to feed the family, or car payment or mortgage payment. Smart money is on keeping yourself alive. Um, and thankfully, you know, the banks, you know, were very gracious with their time because we kept them up to date on everything that was going on. But remember, during that time, a lot of people you know, were losing their homes and not being able to pay their bills and all of that. So the banks only had so much they could do until they said, okay, we, we, we have to reclaim these assets to sell them and try to at least get something back out of it. So mm-hmm. very difficult time. And that burnout um, was, you know, quite frankly, the best thing that could have ever happened to me because it gave me an opportunity to get another chance because again, statistically speaking, I shouldn't have lived, but I did. And I made the choice and I could have chose another path, but I made the choice to take a long, hard look at my life, look at my behaviors, my thoughts, my beliefs, why was it important for me to work all those hours? What was I trying to accomplish? What was I trying to prove? And we see this a lot with leaders that I got to do this because of this and this, and they shortchange themselves to help out others. And that's the wrong way to go about things. You have to take care of yourself first. So that way, when you do choose to give or work or do something like that, you're giving a better version of you. So that's my burnout story. And, and because of it, it ended up birthing the work that I do, you know, after uh, basically reinventing myself. And I want to warn people something real quick. 99% of the people that I deal with and organizations and all that, you do not need to reinvent your entire life. You have to make a couple adjustments here and there, which I'll talk about in a minute. Mm -hmm. But for me, I had to, because the way that I was living obviously wasn't sustainable, nearly killed me. So I realized I have to do something different. And I took the time especially during my recovery, but, you know, for a couple of years later, just to really do a deep dive in me going, okay, why was this important to me in a non-judgmental way, of course, because we are all, we're all our worst judge. You know, we judge ourselves harder than anybody else. So for me, and like, I can't approach it that way. I got to approach it from a curiosity standpoint and just to seek to understand why was this important to me? And once I came to those conclusions, I'm like, okay, what's important to me now? with a foundation of, I have to make sure that I'm my best self first, take care of me first, no one else will. Uh, And when I did that, then the opportunities came up and I started seeing a lot of organizations struggle with burnout and people struggling with it. And I thought, okay, I got to do something about this. So that's how I ended up doing what I do today. Is it fair to say that with burnout, not only do you have to pay attention to what you're doing, but the external sources and the external activities that you're involved with or having an impact on you, you need to pay attention to those too. You have to, you have to keep track of everything you commit to because what happens is we overwhelm ourselves with things that we say yes to. And majority of those things that we say yes to are good things. They make a lot of sense. Uh, But the problem is we only have so much capacity in our ability to do things as far as time is concerned and well-being and other commitments that we've made. So when you say yes to something, you have to make sure you're not saying no to you or saying no to something else. It could be family relationships, friends, other obligations. So you have to have boundaries around what you say yes to. And when you do that, the things you do say yes to, you can be fully committed to it because you don't want to go into it half-heartedly on anything. You want to be able to do the things in life that you enjoy doing. You want to make a difference in your company, your family, your friends, everything. And in order to do that, you got to have some boundaries around those aspects because if you don't, then when you're good, everybody wants to work with you. And, mm-hmm. that's, and then you overwhelm yourself and then you're not good to anybody. That so how do you go about setting those boundaries and communicating them? Because let's face it, we all, we've all, I shouldn't say we all, but many of us have gone through situations where we want to say no, but because it's coming from our boss, 
we feel obligated to say yes, and yet we know it's going to cause us some harm or, you know, cause a few nights of no sleep, you know. So how do you set your boundaries and communicate them so that when you say no, people understand? Well, a well, big thing, especially in the workplace, is instead of saying no to your boss, you know, make sure that you keep a good record of all the things that have been assigned to you, all the tasks you're currently working on, all the projects, all of that, and say, okay, so this, these are all the things that I'm working on right now. If I add this, then I'm not going to be able to properly address the way that I think everybody wants to, these things. So is there anything on this list you want me to pause so I can work on this initiative or, or not? And most good bosses are going to go, Ooh, I overwhelmed you. And Mm -hmm. that's, that's a common thing for those of us that delegate. Many of us don't do a good job of keeping track of what we delegate. Um, Yes, we can do keep track of projects and all that kind of stuff. But when you're good and a lot of people that burn out are typically really good driven type a successful in what they do when they don't have a way to say, if I say yes to this, what am I going to say no to, but flip it to the, putting the premise on the boss saying, okay, these are all the things that I'm working on. If I add this, I'm not going to be able to finish these on time. So what, how do we want to do it? And that becomes a more of a collaborative type of exercise, which is healthier for communication and workflow and everything else. So that's one way to do it at home. You know, you can be a little bit more you know, direct, but loving and caring. So if I do this, I'm not going to be able to do this. So can we figure out a way to be able to meet the needs of whatever we need to do? It's just communication and boils down to more than anything. It's just being communicative about all the things you need to get done. So let's say I'm experiencing burnout. I'm listening to everything you've been saying. And I I'm sitting here and I say, I'm in, I, I'm in burnout, but I don't know what to do. How do I get out of it? How do I start making a change? Um, the, the big things you need to do is number one, focus on your sleep, get good sleep. And, and we just, you know, the timing of this, you know, the Super Bowl was just a few days ago and a lot of people buy brand new televisions around this time. But instead of buying those new televisions, go buy a new mattress and spend some decent money that you can afford on it. That's the best comfortable mattress that will help you get really good sleep that includes pillows and beddings too. Don't go cheap on those things because where do you spend the most consecutive hours of your day in one spot? It's typically where you sleep. So you want that to be the best. Then that way you have a fighting chance to get a good night's sleep. Secondly is making sure you get activity in, you know, I'm not going to tell you to become a gym rat, but work with your medical provider, work with a trainer to get the activity that you need because exercise helps with stress management. If you can keep your managed or you keep your stress managed, it won't become prolonged and prolonged stress turns into burnout. If you don't have prolonged stress, you won't burn out. The next thing is food. I'm not going to tell you to not eat the golden arches or any other place like that. I am going to tell you though, that it makes a lot of sense for you to understand what foods are good for you. I had a food intolerance test done last year, and I was shocked at the number of foods that I have an intolerance to. Um, And they cause inflammation and they cause sometimes even more severe things. But in many cases, inflammation is a common thing. And what happens is your body and your brain's going inflammation. I got to address that. Well, guess what? That means your body's using energy to address that instead of helping you fight through the stressful moments in your life. So mm-hmm. figure out, work with your healthcare provider. There's plenty of online ways to get some of these tests. And if anything, you just, you'll know, oh, wow, I have a intolerance to this or food allergy to something else. And it could be minor, you know, it's not a case where the foods that showed up on this list, you know, I need to have an EpiPen nearby if I, you know, eat something like that. And thankfully I don't have that type of severe allergy to most things, but there are some things that I do and removing those from my diet means my gut bacteria when I'm sleeping can work through the foods that are are quote unquote good for me. And that way it's not using a lot of energy to work that food through. It just kind of passes through like it normally should. And finally, make sure you're doing things in life you enjoy doing, even if it's only for 15 minutes. Yes, we haven't been able to have coffee or go to concerts or sporting events, but watch the event instead of going to it. Um, 
maybe have a virtual coffee date with your friend or meet in a parking lot somewhere. You know, as things are opening up, it's easier to do concerts again. If those are things you like to do, make sure you do those things. But there's a, a list of things that we all like to do and take time and list those things out that you like doing in life and start scheduling those things. Because Michael Hyatt tells us what gets scheduled gets done. If you don't schedule it, you try to fit in between two minutes of appointment times, you're not going to do it. So schedule those things. You do those things, you'll start feeling better. How do I? Okay. What if you know someone um, who may be experiencing some of these things? Yeah. And you're seeing it. Do you have any advice for, and I'll use me as the example, me on how I could help someone who I think might be experiencing burnout, but they're not saying anything. And, you know, they, they obviously, you know, they're trying to put on a happy face for right. everybody, but you can see that it's all clown makeup. You know, it's yeah. no, 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 no. You know, I know you're experiencing something else. Do you have any advice for somebody like me who may want to help someone you know, get out of burnout? Yeah, it, it definitely depends on how, you know, close your relationship is. If it's mm -hmm. a relationship where you, you know, could be candid with them. If not, then you can approach it with kid gloves, basically, as an example, just, you know, saying something like, I've noticed that you're not your normal self is, you know, anything going on? Is there something I can help you with? And if, you know, if, if they can be open with you, they might say, yeah, just, you know, the work hours and things like that. And, and then you, you can share with them some of those things, you know, you know, how, again, depending on how well, you know, them, will vary on the degree of how personal you get. It's like, you know, how are you sleeping, you know, and, you know, how, how are things there? And, you know, maybe instead of us going to a fast food restaurant and grabbing a burger, you know, let's go try this new deli across the street that has, you know, some different types of other foods that uh, aren't as bad, you know, kind of thing. And you just, yeah. and, you know, chat, chat with them and see, and again, ask them to help. In my situation, when I was burned out, I was the last person on the planet that realized I was burned out. Everybody else I talked to after all of this took place and said, oh yeah, we knew you were burned out. And I asked them, well, why didn't you say anything to me? And they said, we did. We did. Really? We, tr we tried to tell you. I was so far deep into it. I couldn't hear. And sometimes people get that because they think I'm going to work through it. Working through it is to stop, you know, remember in school, stop, drop and roll kind of thing. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing here. It's like, if you were working too hard and you're burned out from work, you got to stop. You got to kind of let the engine cool down a little bit. So you can actually diagnose what's going on because you can't work on a car engine while you're driving it. You know, if all the, all the lights on your dashboard are lighting up, um, that's definitely a sign you need to just take a break, stop, and then, you know, do, do some work to figure out what's going on and, you know, start implementing some of these things to focus on, you know, easing the burnout strain. And then, and then from there, you know, the deeper work, of course, is figuring out why you burned out in the first place. And that, that is a, that's a deeper discussion because it varies from person to person. You, you bring up an interesting point. We only have about four minutes left, but you brought up an interesting point here where all of your uh, friends and you know, others knew you were burnt out, but you didn't. Is there a, a fear that someone experiencing burnout who you say, I can handle this, I can manage this, it's a weakness if they reach out for help? It's they feel it's a weakness if they reach out? It could be they feel embarrassed by it. It could be ego they could be so driven. It's like, I want to be a community pillar and I want to open up this clinic and I want it to be the best clinic on the planet. And I'm going to do everything I can, you know, pride gets in the way ego gets in the way. Uh, you know, it's, you know, thankfully, obviously in Canada with, uh, you know, the bell let's talk and other mental health aspects of things that are getting the dialogue going. It's so critical uh, mm -hmm. because, I feel that everyone, and I normally don't paint that broad of a stroke, but I think everyone would benefit from some type of therapy, whether it's to work through past traumas or relationship 
advice or how to better communicate with others or how to, you know, there's, there's room for everything. It's not just a case of you're going to be laying down on a couch, talking to a shrink kind of situation. Now everybody can benefit from it in areas in your life that you want to improve. So that was a big thing for me. I wish I would have done that because it probably would have prevented all kinds of things, but then I wouldn't be talking to you today in all likelihood. So, you know, there's cause and effect, you know, so. Well, we've only got three minutes left now. Uh, can you take a couple of minutes and give us any final thoughts that you have on burnout and for, for our listeners? Yeah, the key thing is to make sure that you do things in life that you enjoy doing. Even if it's only for 10 minutes, let's say you don't have time to have an hour long coffee date with your friend. Can you do 15 minutes? Well, then do it. Guess what? You're still getting the same um, excitement and relaxation of you know, having a conversation with your friend. Do those things. You know, 15 minute walk instead of an hour walk. At least you're getting something in. Uh, make sure you do things in life that you enjoy doing. Schedule them. Make sure you don't skip out on those. Even if you're working long hours. Make sure you do those things because at least that way you're doing something. And then when the time hopefully eases up and you have a little bit more uh, flexibility with your schedule, then you can add those things back and and harmonize things, you know, and life is all about harmonizing things. Make sure you're doing things in life that are beneficial for you. And, you know, that way the work that you do is going to be better because you're coming from a healthier point. Yeah. I like the 15 minute walk thing. Um, uh, I did that for a while too, uh, during the day working, uh, when it was really raining out and couldn't do the 15 minute walk, you know, I take the dog with me, of course, um, or snowstorms cause we are both in Canada. So <laughs> when you can't do that and it's too cold to go out, I actually started teaching myself how to play keyboards. There I you always go. wanted to learn how to uh, play a synthesizer. So I bought a, a cheap little thing. You know, uh, you can buy at Walmart and places like that, you know, but started to learn, you know, basic chords and things like that. And now uh, the 15 minute walk turned into playing along to a couple of songs to learn something new as a break. And then I went back to work and I was completely fresh, felt invigorated, and I was able to focus a lot better mm-hmm. but by doing that. I actually taught myself how to play keyboards, you know, so it's kind of strange yeah. how, uh, you know, some of, the, some of those things work out. Yeah. And it, it, you know, the, the secret sauce, if there is anything is lo- those types of exercises are singular in nature. It's hard to learn how to play keyboard and read a book or play on Instagram or something like that. At the same time, you're focused on one thing. And when you do that, you're deeper into it and you'll learn and you're more relaxed. Your brain isn't going all over the place. So uh, if there's a secret sauce is, you know, avoid multitasking at all costs. It'll, it'll make your life a lot healthier. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, quote, multitasking. <laughs> you know, you get a lot, you work on a lot of things, but nothing gets done. So <laughs> I, exactly. You know, yeah. And then that contributes to your burnout because you start feeling as though you're never accomplishing anything. Exactly. So, so, Michael, cycle. Yeah, we've come to the end of the show. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and time. And congratulations once again on the Burnout Proof, your book. Um, lots of personal examples here. I recommend it to everyone to, to read. So uh, thank you very much, Michael, for sharing. I, I really appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. I'm glad. Thank you for accepting my invitation. <laughs> and to everybody listening and watching, stay prepared, everybody. If you liked that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave a message and let me know what your thoughts are. If you'd like to be a guest on the show to talk about something related to business continuity, disaster management, COVID, personal well-being, anything that's relatable to those subjects, you can reach me through my LinkedIn profile, which is in the video description. And of course, don't forget to subscribe. In the meantime, stay prepared, everybody.